Welcome to The Money Runner. I'm David Nelson. All right, we're live this week. We've been in beta the last four or five podcasts, been working hard on the show. And if this is a good one, we're going to turn the switch on and let everybody watch it. In case you didn't notice, and, and given some of the long faces I've seen in the last couple of weeks, we made $2 trillion last week. And that comes on the heels of stock market losses that wiped out as much as $10 trillion since the start of the year. A lot of long faces out there since the start, and for good reason. But I would call this something of a ceasefire. You know, and every war has a ceasefire. Throughout history, we've seen it in World War I, World War II. And make no mistake, you know, this is something of a war as well. We're, you know, we're entering week 26 at this point. So all of this begs the question, is this something we can build on or just another bear market bounce? Let's find out. Welcome back. By the way, uh, that music you just heard, that was my producer, Chris Patty. Uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant engineer, brilliant musician, great guitarist. By the way, that's not me. Plays everything on that. He's a genius. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have him. All right, let's get started. Uh, we were talking about a ceasefire, and we probably have some veterans out there, and they'll probably understand what I'm talking about right now. Real soldiers understand the term operational tempo. Uh, they often have to work under dramatic circumstances uh, uh, and often have to live on the cutting edge just to survive. Now, of course, real soldiers risk their lives and Wall Street soldiers like myself, we risk only money. But make no mistake about it, we've had some pretty challenging moments uh, this year and our operational tempo has picked up as well. We've had to do much the same thing. We've, watched, we've had to rush from one asset class to the next uh, from one stock to the next, and it felt like we were rushing from one side of the light boat to, to the other. So tonight we're going to have a very special guest, uh, Ken Mahoney of Mahoney Asset Management. No, but before we get started with Ken, uh, I want to make sure we have the right questions. So let me set the stage for this. Like, like most things, you know, uh, when you're dealing with them, there's usually good news and bad news. Let's start with the good news first. Uh, the good news is no one believes this rally. Uh, best thing going for it right now. Uh, you've got a consumer sentiment index, a measure of investor uh, sentiment, uh, lowest level I've seen in decades. The AAA, excuse me, the AAII index, uh, which is the retail investor sentiment survey, that's at the lowest levels uh, probably since the crash of 1987. And coming into last week, the percentage of stocks above their 200-day moving average was at just 14.7%. Now, that's not the lowest levels. Uh, we had it probably at 1% during the financial crisis. I think uh, in COVID, it was somewhere around 3%. But we're at levels right now that were witnessed at other bear market uh, lows. Uh, I call it the red zone, much like football. Uh, we're at a stage right now we at least got to take a look at, at some of these stocks out here. You and I can debate whether or not this is the bottom, but what isn't up for a debate is that a lot of this has been discounted for sure. Uh, you've got some pandemic darling stocks like a Peloton, that's off 93% from, from the highs. Uh, Snowflake, a very popular cloud stock, a wonderful company, maybe too expensive, but if, uh, if we saw the lows last week for this one, it's down 70% 70, 70 in just seven months. If you think back to, say, uh, the dot-com bust, Amazon fell a similar amount, fell up 93%. It took 21 months to do that. Uh, Peloton did it in just 11. The bad news, and there's lots of it, uh, is we've got a born-again Fed that understand they have to do whatever it takes to bring down inflation expectations. And as I said on Fox Business last week, rising rates are kryptonite for risk assets, especially expensive ones. Add the fact that you have an administration that can't put, to get, put together a coherent energy policy, it doesn't make the Fed's job any easier. At least get the order right. Uh, energy independence first, that makes sense. Greener society second. 
you can do both at the same time, but you can't sit by and watch the economy tank because the progressive wing of the party wants you to wage war on the U.S. energy complex. Okay, I put a lot out there, but I'm sure we still have a lot of questions. So this is a perfect segue to bring in our very special guest, Ken Mahoney. Ken is, of course, the president and CEO of Mahoney Asset Management, a Fox Business contributor. But what you don't know, and I didn't know, is that Ken is also a Tony Award winner. We're going to have to get into that. Ken, thanks so much for coming on The Money Runner. Welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here. Respect the great work that you do, David. <laughs> thanks again. Uh, and I really appreciate that. Ken, uh, you know, top of the show, uh, I was talking about operational tempo uh, for traders this year, much almost like a, a military action. Uh, this is different this time around. Uh, it seems like time compression, everything seems to be happening faster. Investors seem to be rushing from one asset class to the next. Has, has anything changed for you this year in terms of the way you have to work? I think so. Look, we have a huge amount of expectations coming into this year. I mean, look, 2019 was a great year. 2020 wasn't a great year initially, but then turned out to be a good year last year. And we have to lower expectations. The good market giveth, the good market taketh. And we have to be aware of the sea change. The sea change actually, though, started in November when the transitory talk of the Fed started saying, well, you know what, it's not transitory. No duh, but that means they're behind the curve. Instead of raising rates last year with GDP of 5 or 6%, here, they're raising rates with a negative first quarter, negative 1.5%, and we don't know what this quarter is going to be. So the wind has changed, the game has changed, and for a lot of people who are new to this, they don't see that. And yet, it's been a seismic change, I believe, since the end of November. You know, it seems, that, at least for my, myself and investors I talk to, everybody's a long-term investor when, when the markets are heading higher. And this has obviously been a, a, a more challenging year, and it's probably going to be a much longer slog, and it, probably not going to get a V-shaped recovery uh, out of this. Uh, what do you tell an investor right now that maybe comes to you and says, you know what, I just want to pull the plug. Uh, I'm done with this investing. How, how, how do you handle that? What, what's, the, what's, the, what's the conversation like? Yeah. I, and look, first, I have to empathize because it feels like that, that they never want to own a stock again. But that's what bear markets do, right? They don't uh, scare you out. They wear you out. But I really think I have to remind them of March 2020, not too long ago, when the Dow went from 29,000 down to 18,000, oh, 11,000 points drop in about three weeks. And that crisis created a good opportunity. 2008, also, of course, the financial crisis. 2000, if you look back at, you know, let's, let's call it the mean reversion over time, like a trend line that goes up over time, and we come will really far be below that, eventually, you know, we'll see that. Now, again, it may not happen right now, but anytime we look back in history at some awful markets, they were not a good time to be selling. In fact, they're a better time to be buying. We seem to have, you know, come into the year, uh, at least right now, we, we have some of the same challenges we had at the start. We have a pretty aggressive Fed. They seem born in again at this point. Have they done enough uh, or are they going to have to go a lot further? They may have to go a lot further. My concern is by raising interest rates and using just monetary policy, which is a blunt instrument and using it bluntly, they're really missing. The real problem with inflation is oil supplies. It's supply jam, jam ups and so forth. And that's fiscal side of things. That's the administration. And this is not like the financial crisis. This is a crisis of confidence. We don't believe the Fed can work through this. We don't believe the administration has the tools and, and the know-how to do this. But the real inflation is not the way to deal with it. The real inflation, I believe, is, has to be more surgical, more tactical, more, more strategic than what's being done right now. You know, it seems clear that, you know, monetary policy on its own is, 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 you know, and I would agree with what you're saying, monetary policy on its own can't possibly handle this. The tools just simply aren't there. Uh, so that puts us on the supply side of this. And it seems like at this point, uh, the administration doesn't even, doesn't even seem to have a, a pathway forward to implement their own policy. I think, you know, a lot of us want a greener society. Uh, but any rational view of a greener society has to include increased fossil fuel, fuel production, at least until these other, other projects can scale. <clears throat> do you think the Fed, do you think the president is just being too political at this point and not focusing on the real issues? Probably. I mean, though uh, Fed Chair Powell basically said, you know, that inflation wasn't caused by the Russian, uh, Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. I, I guess, you know, when you look at the Federal Reserve and what they're trying to do, Again, it's not going to help. And again, to the administration point of view, 
Look, I would love to put a solar panel in my car and drive around. I'm sure you would too and your viewers. I would love to put a, some type of wind turbine. The technology is not th there. Just because of some political cycle and you want to show that you're winning and doing these things, at the end of the day, the technology is not there. The storage is not there. The technology for solar is not there, unfortunately. And so by doing this, really it has put us in the back. And instead of, you know, it just continues to double down on stupidity, quite frankly. Um, it just... And it just bogs my mind that it's self-inflicted, it can be fixed, but it won't be fixed. You know, I want to give our investors, you know, something, you know, to, to, to grab onto out of this. And I know your time is, is short, uh, but, you know, every market, no matter how bad it is, usually presents some opportunities. You know, what are you passionate about, passionate about right now? Do you see any real opportunities for investors, something that maybe a lot of us have missed? I really do. You know, this is a great time to be buying assets that throw off income. If you think about an asset, that's the definition, throwing off income. So I'm actually leaning a little bit more towards bonds. I mean, what happened in the first six months of this year has been awful for bonds, but present an opportunity. Specifically, when I look at ETFs or mutual funds or individual bonds, to me, closed-end bond funds, many of them now are trading 10%, 12% below the net asset value, yielding an accidental 9%, 10% accidental. Why? Many of them come out of $20 a share. They now got blown up thanks to the market at $14, $15 a share and represent now a double digit investment return at these levels. Can it go lower? Yes, it's always hard to pick a spot. But again, what we we're, we're get paid to do, right, is to try to find the opportunity. I think this is a very exciting opportunity to be looking at some of these closed end bond funds, steep discounts, and accidental 10% dividend payers now. Are you looking just in the taxable area or what about munis as well? Yeah, munis have, a, a, again, 3 to 4% in some cases, but the taxables are the ones that, that have seen this huge disparity of the 10 to 15% below net asset value. Now, by the way, we know, uh, we have to, you know, disclaimer, disclaimer, you know, we know the net asset value, you know, we, we could trade below net asset value in these instruments for quite some time. We get that. But would you rather buy a basket of bonds at net asset value or buy at a sharp dis discount? I'd rather buy at a sharp discount to net, as to net asset. How the world has changed, uh, you know, it, it's hard to believe that, you know, the, the next hot investment is actually bonds. You know, we've been so fo focused on stock. <laughs> well, from my perspective. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. I, leave, I left the best for last. I, I teased it at the, top, at the top of the show and I te te teased it at the top of this interview. Uh, I didn't know this, that you won a, a Tony Award. And I, from what I understand, maybe even more awards than, than that, that. Walk us through that. How did that get started? Uh, and, and are you still involved? Um, yeah, I'm not really involved right now because it's the Broadway with COVID and some of the things are going on. But uh, I've been actively involved. One of my closest friends, Frank Wildhorn, a composer for uh, Whitney Houston and for Broadway shows like Jekyll and Hyde, came to me and say, look at these numbers. Why is this not working? Why are these not working? I started digging through. And next thing you know, I'm on the side of the business side as a producer, a co-producer, helping out with the management of the numbers and so forth. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde is the first endeavor I did. It went to zero. didn't last very long. Deep breath, but it was a great, great show. But, you know, they say Wall Street's a small street, Broadway's an alley. Within the first year, I knew five of the top producers, and they tapped me to be the financial guy. So the next one was Porgy and Bass Revival. And sure enough, they again, we were underdogs coming into the Tonys. And at the Tonys, and the winner is... Poor game best. And next thing you're shuffling up, it was almost like that Kramer episode <laughs> on Seinfeld. I was on there shuffling us up on in front of Radio City Musical, looking out to the masses. And I walk away with a Tony Award because I was part of the group that helped produce it. A year later, we do a revival of Pippin. Same thing, sitting in the audience and looking around, enjoying the show. And next thing, Pippin for best revival. And here we are running up on that. So again, some of it's luck, some of it's hard work. I enjoy doing it. Right now, the, the math doesn't work too well because of a whole bunch of factors, including shootouts in New York City, but that's a whole nother topic. But I had a great run. I'm really proud of what I've done in that, in that area, especially in the area of the finances of Broadway. I think I like to think I made a difference there. Wow. Uh, you know, it's been a long time. We, we met a few years ago, uh, probably 5 a.m. in some green room uh, over a uh, over. I think it was green. I think it was blue at 5 a.m. I don't know what color it is at 5 a.m. <laughs> who, who knew? Ken Mahoney, Renaissance man. A Renaissance man. Ken, uh, really a pleasure to have you on the show. I hope you can come back. Thanks. Thanks so much for doing All joining. the great stuff you do. Keep it going. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, that was Ken Mahoney, of course, uh, CEO and president of Mahoney Asset Management. All right, let's wrap this up. Bottom line, every one of these rallies is gonna feel like a false profit until we have some evidence the economy is starting to repair 
and inflation is behind us. Having said that, at the bottom, and I've seen a few of these, no one's going to ring a bell. No treaty is going to get signed. You're just going to look back about a year out and say, oh, yeah, that was the bottom. That's it for this week. If you like the show, please tell your friends. And if you didn't, don't be afraid to speak out. Go to the website. Tell us what we did wrong. We'll try to fix it. I'll be back again next week. Thanks for joining. I'm David Nelson. David, good job. Great job. All right. That was perfect.